This happened about a week ago. For context, I work in a school which has just recently installed video cameras at our gates. Originally, you just had to buzz the gates, we would get a call, and they would say who they were and why they were trying to come in. Obviously, you can imagine that people might lie about why they were trying to do so. Because of that, we recently installed the aforementioned cameras so we could look at the gate whenever someone buzzed in. At around 12 p.m., we had a call from a parent who dropped their child off late, saying she had seen one man on a motorbike with no registration plate wearing a ski mask. Someone in a van was following behind without a registration either, wearing a similar mask. They were driving outside the school together. She thought it was suspicious, so she called in to let us know. This didn't worry us too much initially. The school was protected quite well with some very firm security gates. At 1 p.m. or so, about halfway through lunch break, most of the kids had finished up eating. They were playing outside on a field or playground together. From certain sides of the school, you could see the kids playing on the field from the gates outside. The teachers didn't really supervise those kids out there. It was a high school after all, and kids don't really need to be supervised at that age. As I'm doing my own thing, I peek over to the monitor for a moment, only to see said motorcycle drive up to the gates and said van park up on the opposite side of the street. The man on the bike buzzed in and said he was here to pick up his child. I went through with the standard protocol and asked who he was, to which he only replied James. I then asked the name of his child, and he only said Matthew. Two very common names, of course. I asked for his second name, and they said Thompson. Yet again, another very generic name. Because I had no life at the time, pretty much, I knew the majority of my pupils' names, as I dealt with classless quite a lot. I had never heard of a Matthew Thompson in this school. I don't even know why I bothered to ask them these questions. It was very clear this person was not a parent. Our security cameras were quite well hidden, so I assume the person asking didn't see them. I asked them to take off the masks they were wearing, which caused them to frantically look around. The man looked back at his friend in the van and made a let's go gesture. They started running and sped off. Pretty stupid of me, I know but I had no idea how to handle the situation in the moment. I guess I should have gotten a colleague to call the police while they were still there. We did call the police after, but we never heard anything back. In 1987 or 1988 or so, I was eight or nine years old, living in a blue-collar suburb of Seattle. My mom had just started working after being a stay-at-home mom for many years, so my dad would now get me and my brother off to school in the morning. I would wake up when my dad was just getting into the shower that was attached to the master bedroom and would pour myself a bowl of cereal and watch early morning cartoons. This morning was different, though. As I was getting ready to do my morning routine, the phone suddenly rang. My dad was still in the shower, so I answered the phone myself. Cell phones were for rich people, and cordless phones were a thing but still a rarity. Our phone was connected to the wall. I sat down on my parents' bed and picked it up to answer. Hello? I said. Do you know who this is? Said the voice on the other end. It was an older man's voice. It sounded like my dad's, but not quite there. My dad didn't have many male friends. His best friend was his cousin, Jerry, and for some reason, I assumed this must be him. Hi, Jerry. My dad's still in the shower, I said. Oh, that's okay. I wanted to talk to you, actually. Say, do you want to come with me after school to get a nice present for your dad? Since I believed the person on the other end and they didn't dispute they were Jerry, I didn't feel threatened at all. I didn't feel uncomfortable or like there was anything wrong. Instead, I felt an opportunity to spend time with a family member and get my dad a nice surprise. I said something about that sounding fun and that I'd quite like to do it. I didn't even think it was odd at all, even though Jerry had never called that early in the morning and certainly never asked me to go with him anywhere alone before. 
All right, what are you going to be wearing? He asked. I was a little bit puzzled. I guess there were a lot of kids at my school and it might be hard to find me. I'm going to wear my favorite outfit today. A black and white sweater that says international news on it with a white turtleneck and some white stirrups, I said. The stirrups were really popular back then and white pants were even more popular. For some reason, this part really sticks out in my memory, almost like it's permanently embedded into my brain. Maybe it was because my mom had just washed my favorite outfit and I was so excited to wear it. Maybe I knew deep down that something was off though. I remember my voice fluctuating in the moment. I remember a feeling of excitement and a feeling of strangeness. You know, there's so many kids around I might not find you. What do you look like again? You know what I look like, I giggled. That was the moment my dad rushed out of the shower. He must have heard me talking because he walked into the bedroom and immediately said, Who are you talking to? Oh, it's just Jerry, I said. He grabbed the phone out of my hand, but as soon as he did so, the line went dead, and he hung it up. He asked me what I was talking about. I told him Jerry had said he was going to pick me up after school, and he wanted to know what I would be wearing. He told me that was not Jerry, and to not wear that outfit. I thought it was a bit odd when after that my dad picked me up from school, and continued to do so for several weeks after. My dad always worked until 5, and never went home early. He never mentioned the phone call, and never mentioned what his thoughts were. He didn't even talk to me about not telling people what I was wearing on the phone. We just never spoke about it again. About a year ago, I was listening to a podcast, and I got super freaked out when I heard a story about another girl that went missing after arranging to meet someone over the phone to get a surprise for her mother. We didn't live that close to each other, some states away, but it was eerily similar. It was the exact same type of call. Was someone trying to abduct me that day, or was it just a prank call? I guess I'll never find out. My family used to move around a whole lot. That meant that when I was younger, I was almost always changing schools. It got to be very hard to make friends, not only because of all the moving, but because I always expected to be leaving again very soon. And that kept me from wanting to form new attachments. We moved so often it seemed futile. I mostly just kept to myself whenever I entered a new school. Well, of course, anyone who's been to school knows exactly how the loners are treated, especially in middle school. That was where I was in my education when this story takes place. My family had just moved to a semi-rural area. I remember this being the worst time in my life, and I still consider it to be that way, honestly. I was in the seventh grade, and I remember this year I turned 13. I had always been a bit of a small kid, and the fact that I was so quiet and a loner just made this whole thing worse on me. The bullying started pretty early, and it got pretty nasty too. In fact, it had gotten so bad I would try to make myself sick in the morning to avoid going to school. I would wear wet socks to bed or put dirty things in my mouth. Back then, we actually thought something like that could make you sick. There was constant name-calling. Kids would always try to force me into fights with them. I never wanted to fight, and there was never any reason. I remember once these two bullies held me, while another burst a water balloon on me. Then they went around joking and telling everyone I had a wet dream. It was humiliating, just being at that school. The worst part is that the teachers never did anything about it. It happened on the bus, too. A few of the guys who gave me a hard time at school were on the same bus as me and lived in the same general area I did. Fortunately, I lived 45 minutes away and out in the country, so being home was the best thing for me. I would never encounter anyone else who tormented me way out there. Summer vacation because of this was my favorite time of year. In that particular summer, it was even more welcome than before. I was able to just be home and not have to deal with the constant torment that was visited upon me. One of my favorite things to do was go out exploring into the woods. I would do that maybe a few times a week during the summer. There were a lot of woods in the area, so I was never short of spaces to explore. 
Sometime in the middle of the summer, I was out exploring in an area I'd never been in before. I'd come across some berry bushes and was surprised to find a good haul of blackberries. I decided I would pick them and bring some home, because they were pretty good actually. As I was walking along, I found a dead squirrel. It was obvious the squirrel had been shot and just left there to die. Whoever had shot it was doing it for fun, not for food. I found a bird in a similar condition. It was heartbreaking to see any of this. I wondered why people like to kill animals for fun. As I was out hiking this new area, I began to hear what sounded like footfalls every now and then. I'd never encountered any other people when I was out exploring before. I'd only once in a while come across an animal that wasn't a bird or a squirrel even, but I'd never seen anything dangerous out here. The footfalls I was hearing seemed like there was something bigger. I didn't think there were things like dangerous cats or anything like that around, but I did get a bit concerned when I heard what sounded like someone laughing. Then I knew if I had heard this correctly, there was a person out here in the woods following me. My first thought was I was about to get in trouble for trespassing. I didn't know who owned the land I was exploring on, so I began to get a little bit scared. I decided to go back towards my house, or at least try to find a road to walk along. I went off and kept hearing sounds that indicated someone was in the woods following me. I kept looking around, trying to see who it could be, but whenever I looked in the direction of the noises, they'd stop immediately, and I wouldn't see anything. Then I'd hear the laughing begin again. When I turned around to face it the last time, my heart froze in my chest. I was terrified. I was looking at a kid named Billy, one of my worst bullies in school. He was with a bully friend of his, Kyle, and the scariest thing of all was that both of them had rifles. They emerged from behind the trees to face me. I didn't know what to do. I was terrified at the scary looks on their faces. I thought about those dead animals. I was positive it was these two that had killed them. Kids my age shouldn't be out in the woods with rifles. I'm sorry, being 13 and doing that sort of thing is just wrong. The proof I have of this? Both of them pointed their rifles at me right away. Billy taunted me, calling me horrible names and racial slurs. Then they said I was dead. I turned around to run. As soon as I did, I heard a gunshot ring out. I didn't feel anything, so I know I didn't get shot myself. But needless to say, I was terrified. I fell down to the ground. Kyle and Billy ran up to me and pointed their rifles at me. They called me names and made fun of me because I was scared. I didn't want to move. I just laid there on the ground, hearing their insults and being terrified. It was the worst feeling I'd ever had in my life. Then the most amazing thing happened. Billy, what the fuck are you doing? I heard a man's voice call out. Oh, uh, hey dad. We were just playing around, weren't we? He asked me. He had a look in his eye that said he would shoot me if I didn't agree. They were hunting me, I told Billy's dad. A huge man came up and grabbed the rifle out of Billy's hand and put it on the ground. He said four words I'll never forget. Cut me a switch. Billy looked terrified. He took out his pocket knife and cut a switch from a bush or something. He handed it to his dad, and his dad began to beat him with the switch in front of all of us. Billy was reduced to tears, and I could tell Kyle was scared he would be next too. Lucky for him, Billy's dad deigned not to punish him. Help him up the dad demanded, and Billy did as he was told. You apologize right now. Billy apologized, and the dad asked me if I was alright. I told him I was fine. He grabbed the rifle in one hand and Billy with the other, and he dragged the two of them off. I think Billy was going to be a lot worse for wear when he got home with his dad. Although my story does have a fortunate ending, it was a terrifying experience. Bullies are scary to begin with, but bullies willing to kill are much worse. Billy didn't bother me again after that. He just gave me horrible looks in school, but he never talked to me from then on. Several years ago, I worked at a crisis unit for the acutely mentally ill. It was a 10-bed unit where individuals would come to stay as a step down from psychiatric hospitalization or a diversion to prevent psychiatric hospitalization in the first place. I often worked alone on the weekends. 
One Friday evening, we received an admission, Michael. Background info was provided, with the referral indicating a diagnosis of antisocial personality disorder, a recent release from prison as well, after serving a sentence for murder. I completed the initial intake meeting with Michael, during which time he said some sexually explicit things to me. I made it clear this was inappropriate, and that confidentiality was limited in that the staff working on the unit as part of his treatment team would be privy to anything he said, or anything said in subsequent one-on-one -on -one sessions. He responded well to that redirection. We finished the intake, and I went about the rest of my shift until about 11 p.m. that night. He approached me in the office and asked if I was working alone. Luckily, at that time, I was not alone. I told him my male co-worker was just in the adjoining office. After this encounter, I explained the situation to my co-worker, who read my shift summary and decided to sit down with Michael and tell him the way he was acting was not acceptable. He could risk being let go from the program if it continued. The next morning, I was working alone from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m., Around 9, I went to wake up another client, Jeremy, to administer his medications. The room Jeremy was assigned to was at the end of the hallway, and he was usually quite slow to get up in the mornings. While I was knocking on Jeremy's door, Michael approached me to tell me he didn't appreciate I'd shared the things he'd said to me with my coworker. I explained to him that I'd already told him anything he said to me would be shared with the rest of the treatment team, regardless of how I felt about it. Michael became more agitated and jumped up in my face, backing me into the corner in front of Jeremy's bedroom door. At this point, Jeremy had woken up and heard what was happening outside his room. He came out of his room and stood between Michael and myself and told Michael he needed to get the fuck out of there. Michael went back to his room, and I contacted my supervisor, who told me to document the encounter and continue with my shift. Needless to say, I left the job shortly after this incident. I'm thankful that Jeremy had the presence of mind to intervene on my behalf. Considering he was also a client with mental illness, I often wonder what would have happened if Jeremy hadn't woken up in that moment, or if he would have been in a severe state of mental delusion and would have become agitated as well. So this happened to me earlier and I don't think I'll be sleeping tonight. I'm currently staying in a remote part of the United Kingdom and having a bit of a break from working. This means more time to pursue my hobbies, one of those being photography. I had scoped out a creepy looking tree formation in a nearby forest. I set my camera and tripod up as the sun was coming down, you know, for that extra creepy vibe. As I was happily taking photos there, I see a woman pass the entrance to the arched trees. This woman had parked her car next to mine when I arrived. She went past a couple of times, looking at me for prolonged periods with each time she passed by. I assumed that maybe she wanted to come up this path but saw I was taking photos, and so decided to walk elsewhere for a moment. Approximately five minutes went by. She appeared again, this time walking towards me dragging her left side slightly with a very strange limp. She stopped once and stared at me for a few moments, then started walking towards me again. I called out to ask her if she was okay. I was starting to put my things away at this point and readying my tripod for use in self-defense if necessary. The vibe she was giving was way off. She began to grunt at me, then stopped and stared again. At this point, this woman was close enough for me to realize that she was actually a man in woman's clothing with a wig. An uncomfortable moment passed by. They began to grunt at me again, walking towards the edge of the path. They grabbed a pile of leaves and started throwing them around, grunting some more and then walking off aimlessly into the forest. I called my friend to tell her what just happened and asked that she stay on the phone in case this person came back. I wanted to just take a couple of more photos and then I'd be out. For a good ten minutes or so, though, I heard the crunching of leaves circling me in the forest. I tried to convince myself it was just wildlife. Suddenly, the sound stopped. I took the photos I wanted. I hadn't seen or heard the person for around fifteen minutes now, so I assumed I must be safe. I leave the path and see that the car is also gone as well. 
thank fuck. Very quickly though, I noticed there was a man walking towards me from the entrance. It was the exact same guy. He had changed into men's attire. As he walked past me, he shot me an evil grin that sent shivers down my spine. I don't scare easily, but this guy was just giving off all the wrong signals. An overwhelming feeling of dread washed over me. I was still on the phone at this point and holding my tripod over my shoulder just in case. I quickened my pace and got back into my car. As I did so, I saw him come out of the lane I had been down, stop and look around, then start walking towards my car with intent. I videoed this for a while, then hauled the fuck out of there, driving past that car he had moved just down the road. I remember thinking to myself, what in the gray beard fuck just happened? 